shower I suffer so pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you very much for tonight. Thank you because you revealed to us the very heart stirring of the Lord Jesus Christ as he prayed in the garden, Thy will be done. Lord, we pray as we come together today, that's the mind of Christ. You give to every one of us today so that we too will be able to pray with deep conviction that your will will be done in our lives in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you grant us the key of knowledge that we'll understand the scriptures. You grant us the power, the grace, the strength to back up what you teach us so that, Lord, we too, like Christ, will be completely consecrated unto you, dedicated to you, devoted to you, submissive to you, so that your will, only your will, will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me a good amen. You can be seated. Thank you. We're looking at Matthew chapter 26. And I'm reading from verse 38 and verse 39. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little farther, and he fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. In that verse of scripture, the latter part of verse 39, you have the summary of what everyone should say, what everyone should do, man or angel, saints on earth or saints in heaven. You have the desire of the Almighty God expressed that He as God, He as Lord, He as Creator, He as Redeemer. What He wants is that His will will be done. And Jesus Christ, the perfection of all the qualities expected by the Lord, He came at this time to have a climax of his ministry and his mission here on earth. We've seen the life of Jesus already. And as you look at the life of Jesus from the very beginning until this very time, you can summarize the life of Jesus in these words, Not my will, but thine be done. In everything he did, in everything he said, in every place he went, in every miracle he performed, in every message he, 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 every message he preached, everything that he did, you can see that in fact he said, I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Another time you find him saying, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Well, then we understand that from the very beginning of the life of Jesus here on earth, until this time, it's been taken up with just the will of the Father. But now, we come to this situation that is very demanding. And you'll see the sorrow of heart, the grief in his heart. And he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. In fact, even unto death, he said, tarry ye here and watch with me. And then he went to the Father in prayer, O oh, my Father, if it were possible, were it not for the redemption of the world, were it not for the fact that the salvation of the world depends squarely on this, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, for the convenience of the flesh, I would have wished that the cup will pass from me. For the avoidance of agony and sorrow, 
and suffering and heartache. And this sorrow that's about to claim my life, even before going to the cross, I would have wished the cup will pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Verse 42. He went away again the second time. And he prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, once again, thy will be done. And he came and he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them. And he went away again. And he prayed the third time, saying the same words. That means he said again, Thy will be done. This account you'll find in Mark. This account you'll find in Luke as well. Look at Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22, looking at it from verse 41. Luke 22, verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about his stones cast. And kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Why the repetition in Mark and Luke? It's for emphasis. It's to remind us. This is the whole duty of man. This is the climax and the conclusion of the life of Jesus Christ on earth. And this is the perfect example that the Almighty God has laid down for us in the life of Jesus Christ. That you too, as a follower of Jesus, that you too, as a person saying, I'm redeemed, I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm a child of God. And I'm following the example of Jesus Christ. Here is what the Lord has laid down for you and for me. Thy will be done. As you think about your life, and you think about your ministry, and you think about the things you try to avoid, and the things you try to accept, do you understand that many times the word of God, the will of God, will be contrary to our convenience, and contrary to our flesh, and contrary to what we like and what we desire, and yet we need to come to the Lord every time, saying, Lord, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The Lord has given us a free will. And you'll find out every day you have to make a choice. Every day there will be things that confront you. That you will say, if it were to be left to my convenience, and to my desire, and to my ambition, and to my aspiration, and to the things that will be convenient for me, here is what I would have chosen. And then you come to the position where you have to say, Lord, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And brothers and sisters, it will not always be easy. Uh, sometimes it will come with grief. Sometimes it's going to be hard. Sometimes it's going to be tough. But all the same, the evidence that we are following the Lord... And the evidence we have the grace of God in our lives is to say, Lord, it isn't easy. And you didn't promise me life will be a bed of roses. You didn't promise me obeying the word of God, obeying the commandment of God, and doing the will of God will always be easy. You have not promised me that. It's tough. But as tough as it is. And flesh would like to avoid it. Would like to dodge it. I'm not going to dodge it. As tough, as hard, as it is. I come before you. Only asking for grace. And I'm saying like Jesus Christ said, Not as I will, but as thou wilt. In this um, narrative in Luke, were told something that Matthew did not record, that Mark did not even put down. Look at it 
in verse 43. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. It was a thought that an angel had to come from heaven to strengthen him so that he will do the will of God. And then in verse 44, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And that tells you then the agony of heart that the Lord Jesus Christ went through. I'm speaking to you tonight on consecration and submission to God's will. Consecration and submission to God's will. We're going to consider three parts in the message. Number one, spiritual perception and discovery of God's will. Spiritual perception and discovery of God's will. What's God's will? The average Christian doesn't have an outer, a judge, the least part of what it means to discover the will of God. And, and most Christians, uh, they think that is when you are getting married, you need to discover the will of God. What's the will of God? How do you perceive the will of God? Spiritual perception and discovery of God's will. Point number two. Submission and preparedness to do God's will. Submission and preparedness to do God's will. Number three, supplication and power to do God's will. Supplication and power to do God's will. Number one, spiritual perception and discovery of God's will. When did Jesus discover this will of God that he had to go to the cross and die? When did he have the knowledge, the perception that this is the will of God to go to the cross and to suffer in the hands of the unbelievers and the sinners and to shed his blood and to go through the agony and the pain and the suffering and make his life an offering, a sacrifice for sin? He had discovered this long, long before this time. And he had even revealed it to his own disciples in Matthew chapter 16, reading from verse 21. Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Spiritual perception. He knew he was going to die. He knew the place where that will take place. And he knew the people that will be used for that to take place. And you know something? He did not avoid Jerusalem. Neither did he avoid the chief priests. Neither did he avoid the people that were to be used in bringing the suffering and the grief and the sorrow and the sacrifice and the pain of death upon him because he knew it is the will of God. Doesn't that tell you something? That when you know the will of God and you know that it may be attended with suffering, with agony, you shouldn't avoid it if it's the will of God Go through it. If it is the will of God, rejoice in it. Discover. Have spiritual perception that if this is the will of God, the appointment of the Lord for me, it is something that will give me grace to go through. And then we're told in verse 21 from that time forth, uh, from verse uh, 22, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. They shall not be unto thee. He did not have spiritual perception. 
he had not discovered the will of God. All Peter knew about the will of God is healing, casting out devils, providing food for the 5,000, will of God. All that Peter knew about the will of God is, we have told all the night, and we caught nothing. Then cast your net there, at thy word I will. And he caught a multitude. See the will of God. It's the will of God to provide for my need. It's the will of God that if there is poverty, he'll provide prosperity. Ah, that's not the end of the will of God. The will of God is for our Lord, Jesus Christ, our Savior. The perfect sacrifice to go to Calvary in Jerusalem and die for our sins. He took him and he said, this will not happen to you. But he turned, he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. You will see here then that you need spiritual perception. In fact, that's what the Lord is telling us. He says we ought to know what the will of God is. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. Ephesians 5, verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The Lord wants us to have spiritual perception. To have understanding. To have knowledge. And know very much, assuredly, what the will of the Lord is. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 22, having the knowledge of the will of God. Having understanding of the will of God. Having assurance of what the will of God is for your life. And for my life. And for the life of every believer. Acts chapter 22, verse 14. And he said, the God of our fathers has chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will. The Lord has chosen you, that you will know his will. Have you discovered that will yet? Do you have spiritual perception? As to what the will of the Lord is yet. Are you just saying, I am saved. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. You say, yes, we know. What's the will of God? How are you to spend the rest of your life? Where are you supposed to be? Are you so uncertain that right now, in what you are doing, you are at the center of the will of God? Well, I'm working for God already. That's not the question. I'm a coordinator already. That's not the question. Although I'm not on full time, but I'm doing my best. That's not the question. Do you know, assuredly, without a shadow of doubt, that the little you are doing now, the much you are doing now, the limit of what you are doing now, is absolutely the totality of the will of God for your life. What are you going to find out? Are you going to live the rest of your life without ever discovering the will of God for yourself? Because it says here, He has chosen you, that thou shouldest know, that thou shouldest know his will and see the just one and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. Is there any ordering here? That is, you have three things there. Number one, know his will. Number two, see the just one. Number three, hear the voice of his mouth. Can we see the Lord without shame on that final day if we never discover the will of God for us? What if you end your life? That is, when you come to the end of the journey and then you are about to go to the great beyond and then just at that time, 
when no time remains, you just discover here is what you could have done. Here is what you should have done. Here is the place you should have gone. Here is what you should have done for the glory of God. And you are just knowing at the point of leaving this world, the will of God. And that's why he chose you. But you never cared. You never found out. You just live from day to day. And you were satisfied with the little, the limit of what you were doing. And he has chosen you that you will know his will. And you will hear the voice of his mouth. When last did you hear the voice of his mouth? Apart from the words of the mouth of the preacher. When last did you hear, point blank, very clearly, the voice of his mouth? Here is what to do. Here is the place to go. Here is the assignment you are to carry out. Here is how you are to do what you are doing. When last did you see the just one? Because you see Paul the Apostle, he saw him. He saw him, he heard his voice on the, on the way to Damascus. He was directed, he is a chosen vessel. And I will show him what he will suffer for my sake. And he said, when I had that in Galatians, and he called me, he said, I did not confer with flesh and blood. As if that were not enough, he went to the third heavens. And was very, very clear how he was to spend every day of his life, every week of his life, every month of his life, every year of his life. He saw the just one. And he knew he was not fighting and beating the air. He said, my life has purpose. I know what I'm doing. He has chosen me. I am at the center of the will of God. Have you discovered that? He wants us to discover that. Now, as we talk about the spiritual perception and the discovery of the will of God, look at this in First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 4, 3 and 4, actually verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to, the, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It says, uh, uh, before you go too far, number one, the will of God is the salvation of everyone. It's your salvation. Maybe you have not been living a straight life, a good life, a righteous life, an upright life. And then the devil is whispering in your heart, Maybe after all, it's not the will of God for you to be saved. Discover the will of God. It is the will of God that you be saved. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth in First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. You know some people, and they say, I, I guess this sanctification is not for everybody. Because I have prayed. And the more I pray, the more I get myself. I still see the thing inside me. Yes, thank God, I'm born again, I know that. I don't go out to do this and to do that and to do that, which is not right or proper. But inside me, the thoughts that go on there, the disposition I have in my heart, the tendencies I see in my spirit, and the things I know privately between me and the Lord, although it's not an outbreak of sin, but I know there is something that shouldn't be there within and I've prayed and prayed. I don't know what I'm going to do again. Maybe this sanctification and holiness is not for 
everyone. Don't say that. But this is the will of God. Even your sanctification, holiness of heart, purity of heart, that the Lord will purge you, that the Lord will cleanse you, that the Lord will purify you, that the Lord will take the, mark, the blood of Jesus, and that blood is shed on the cross of Calvary. It'll apply it to your soul, apply it to your heart, and cleanse you through and through, until you are white, much whiter than snow. Here is the will of God, even your sanctification. It tells us something about the will of God. Now, in First Peter chapter 2, will of God. Have you discovered this will of God? In First Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 15. It says, for so is the will of God, that with well-doing, Ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Will of God. What's the will of God for you in your place of work? And those ignorant people, they're ignorant of the grace of God. Ignorant of the goodness of God. And when you do right, and you refuse to change uh, the accounts, and you refuse to go into bribery and corruption with them, and you refuse to go into all the mismanagement of funds they are doing there. They persecute you. What's the will of God for you? You can be them, join them. That's not the will of God. Everybody is telling lies and they are getting away with it. So why am I suffering just like that? Join them. That's not the will of God. And everybody, they know what they do. All they lobby, all they bribe, the so that they can be promoted. Do I do like that to you? What's the will of God? That what well doing, you will silence the people that are ignorant. It says, as free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. That's the will of God. When you are free, and nobody is going to hold you, nobody is going to be able to even punish you, but you don't choose that freedom as a cloak of maliciousness, but as a servant of God. That's the will of God. Honor all men. Do you know that's the will of God? And you start from the family. Husband, you honor your wife. Wife, you honor your husband. Children, you honor your parents. That's the will of God. And then you leave the church, you leave the family, you come to the church. And see those brothers there, you honor them. You see these sisters there, we don't trample on them. We don't push them down. We don't bully on them. We don't treat them like rats that we use in rubbing the ground, mopping the ground. We respect the women in the church. Because we honor all men. You leave the church and you go to your house. You honor your landlord. You honor the tenants. Respect. You prefer them above yourself. Your words, your action to them will be words and actions of honor. You go to your place of work. You honor your manager, your director. They will know this fellow is a Christian. Because the culture of all the people in the place of work is a culture of rudeness. But in your place of work, you honor your seniors, those who are above you. And if you're a student, you honor your lecturers or your teachers. Honor all men. Do you know this is the will of God? Are you at the center of the will of God? Have you discovered the will of God yet? And it says, love the brotherhood. You see that? That's the will of God. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. <laughs> Look up here. You know, there are, I, I don't know. Some people, maybe they read their Bibles upside down. As you find them talking to one another. 
And they, know, they say, you know what? In my place of work, my boss is even a deeper life member. But I'm telling you, I don't respect him. The way he acts, the way he talks, he doesn't act as if we are from the same church. And two, I try to act to him like that. And since he doesn't even know any member of the church in the place of work, me too. When I get to the place of work, in fact, you are my friend. I will tell you the truth. Even the unbelievers in a place of work, they respect him more than I respect him. And I do it deliberately. My dear friend, you have not discovered the will of God yet. The will of God is that you are servants, civil servants, that you will be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also unto the forward. For this is thankworthy. Listen, this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. That's the will of God. It tells us in chapter 3 of that same first Peter, chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 16. Having a good conscience. That whereas they speak evil of you, as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better. It is better if it be the will, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well doing, and not than for evil doing. It is better that you suffer for well doing. If it be the will of God. Where have we gone? Which part of the Bible have we been reading? That once a suffering comes. As a result of taking our stand. As a result of doing right. As a result of preaching. Or living on the basis of conviction. We suffer. Then we say, a way we're preaching. I can't be a Zona leader anymore. I cannot be a woman rep anymore. You, you know what I'm going through in my district? In our district, they don't want anybody speaking the truth. A case came out. All I did was, I said what I knew about it. I'm telling you, my dear sister, if you see what I saw, from all the other workers. And they knew this is the truth. My only crime. Is that none of them was willing to open their mouth. And speak the truth. And I came up and I said. Coordinator. We don't need to look for the solution far away. Brother so and so. Sister so and so. Brother so and so. They know about this matter. Uh, my brother. Were well, you not the one that said such and such? A boss is so and so. Did I not hear? Why are we wasting all this time interview, interview? We know the truth of the matter. And then we judge the case. Since that time, our dear sister that had the conviction to tell the truth is suffering. And now she says, in my life, Till I die. Whatever I see, I will close my mouth. Because I have discovered nowadays that if you open your mouth and you tell the truth in our district, the other sister the other time while we were at the retreat, uh, during the break, she also told me what I'm going through in my district, she's going through in her district. I've decided now. I will not live deeper life. I will stay here. I like the message. But I will take the message for myself privately. Whatever I see, I will never talk again. Why will you not talk? Ah, because I suffered. Keep on suffering. That's the will of God. Don't you read your Bible? Why are you running away from the will of God? 
Yes, it's painful. Don't I know? Yes, it's grievous. Don't I know? Yes, there's much sorrow attending it. Don't I know? Jesus was exceeding sorrowful. Even unto death. And yet he went to the Father and he said, My Father, if this cup will not pass by me, except I drink it, thy will be done. That is it right there. Verse 17, chapter 3. For it is better. If the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing, than for evil-doing. Chapter 4, verse 19. In chapter 4, verse 19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. Have you discovered that now? Salvation, will of God. Sanctification, will of God. Suffering, for righteousness sake, will of God. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God, commend the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. That's the will of God. Now, what's to be our attitude in that will of God? In First Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, from verse 18. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I see it in your district. Don't grumble. Praise God. Are you getting on with your coordinator? Don't complain. Praise God. I is the women coordinator in your district. Don't gossip. Praise God. Are you finding your group, especially, you know, I hear that in your group, uh, your group coordinator will preach and preach and will not know that uh, maybe he doesn't use his watch when he preaches and he goes on and on and he doesn't know when to stop. Uh, that's what I hear about your group. How is it over there? Praise God. God is on the throne. We're getting on fine. Praise God in everything. That's the will of God. That's the will of God. Ah, I'm suffering. If you know what I'm going through in our district, that's not, that's not the way to talk. If you know the will of God. The Lord is using that thing in your district, in your group, in your locality, in your family, in your place of work, to perfect His work in you. Thank God for his work of perfection. Thank God for his pruning. Thank God for his chastisement. Thank God for all those people, whether they are Judas Iscariot or what, they are fulfilling a part of the will of God. Praise the Lord. Whoever they are, Caiaphas, high priest, Pilate, all of them, they're fulfilling the will of God in the life and the ministry and the calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. They may come by different names, and they may come from different directions. They may come with a mob. They may come with an individual. They may come with gossip. They may come with chastisement. They may come from any direction. Thank God that the Lord is operating everything, moderating everything to perfect you. That's why it says that in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Point number two, submission and preparedness to do God's will. I come back to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew Chapter 26, verse 39. In Matthew 26, verse 39. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. 
submission. Submission. Not as I will, but as thou wilt. And you know, my dear sisters there, and this man we call your husband doesn't have a job. How I wish he will have a job. How I wish he'll have enough money to take care of you. How I wish he'll be able to have enough provision and do his duty. But, dear sister, we don't pack out of the house because of that. We don't divorce because of that. Yes, I understand. Hunger is not good. Yes, I understand that the woman earning money and to feed the children and to pay house rent, yes, I know, it's not convenient. It wasn't convenient to the Lord. Does the Lord have something that he is passing me through this? Why is it? I have a job. My husband does not have a job. Why is it not the other way around? Who am I to question God? What I know is, if it be possible, let this situation in my family pass by. But if not, not as I will, but as thou wilt. My dear brother, I understand. See, how can we, we're married now for two years, we're married for three years, those we marry together, they are bearing and they are carrying the second child. And we are still looking up to God. I understand. I understand the way you feel. They are going in the heart. We don't divorce because of that. We don't separate because of that. We don't drive her out because of that. We don't call mommy to come from the village and pack her load away because of that. If it be possible, this very year, let this cup of the shame of barrenness pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Prayer warrior man, how can we understand? I pray for brother so and so, he got a job. I pray for myself, not got a job. I prayed for sister so and so, she became pregnant. My wife, I prayed for her, she is not pregnant. How do I understand? What's all this? And as I go about, see the way the people are talking about me. I understand. It is not convenient. Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup of shame and reproach pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt, the submission and preparedness to do the will of God. We will do the will of God. I said we will do the will of God. Your friends can hinder you from doing the will of God. Your friends may bring advice. Not only advice, your friends may even say, ah, what kind of Christianity is this your own? Are we not hearing the same message? Why are you so dense like this? Okay, if you will not fight for yourself, I'll fight for you. You may have a Peter behind you and beside you that will draw the sword and say, what? You want to take my master in my presence? Cut off the ear. And Jesus said, Peter, if you cannot drink the cup, why do you want to disturb me from drinking my cup? What's your problem? Don't you know everyone that carries the sword will die by the sword? Pull back your sword. Don't you think, don't you know, I can call 12 legions of angels and fight for me if I did that? How will the will of my father be done? I would rather leave those angels idle, not do anything, not come and fight for me, 
so that I can do the will of God. When you understand that, that Jesus has the possibility of calling 12 legions of angels to fight so that this will of God will not be done. But he said, no, not me. I'm not going to call those angels. And I'm not even going to praise Peter for fighting for me. Don't fight for me. Let me go through the will of God for me. That's what the Lord wants us to learn. That in your life, whatever is going on, you know that the cup will be limited to what the grace of God will bear in your life. That's why you're submissive. That's why you're ready. That's why you are prepared. The will of the Lord alone be done. In John chapter 18. John chapter 18. Verse 10 and verse 11. John 18 verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having his sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant. And cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter. Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father has given me. See how he's talking about his father. Not Jesus your father is giving you a cup of suffering. My father. My father. Personal pronoun. You know, there are some people, they don't know the will of God. And once suffering comes, once pain comes, once inconvenience in any way comes, it changes their language. It changes their relationship, personal attachment to the one through whom the suffering is coming. But he said, it's my father. He has appointed it. The cup that my father has given me, shall I not drink it? That's what we're learning from the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to do His will. Come back to Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew chapter 26, reading from verse 15. Are you learning something here that when somebody is going through a situation, husband and wife, and a wife happens to be your friend. And a wife is telling you that, my dear sister, I hope you are praying for me. Because uh, what I'm going through at home, in fact, I just control myself not to be crying every time in the public. What do you do? Do you begin to advise them how they will rebel against their husbands? Because you are sympathizing with your fellow sister. And if you happen to be the forceful, aggressive, and bold sister, you go to the husband yourself. Ah, uh, so and so. My friend told me that the way you are treating her at home is like uh, you are not even born again. Have you prayed before going to confront the husband of another sister like that? My dear sister, be careful. The cup that my father has given her, will she not drink it? And if it's a brother, talking to another brother, my brother be praying for me that I will not fall into temptation. Because, you know, my wife at home talk about food. The food is not good. That's even, that's not too serious. I can go to the restaurant, I can go anywhere and go and eat. But between you and myself, my dear brother, this woman, 
I hope she will not push me to go and commit adultery someday. Because every time I say that, my dear sister, how about I am sick? I'm weak now. I cannot think about that now. If I say, why are you talking like this? Yesterday you were sick. The other day you were sick. This time you are sick again. She will pack her clothes and go and sleep in the sitting room. My brother, be praying for me that I will not uh, go and commit immorality. Are you the brother that will go to another person's wife and say, come here. What's happening to you? You want to make your husband to fall? What are you doing like this? Who has put the whip in your hand to go and whip another person's wife? What are you sympathizing with the man? Tell him to go back to the cross and to go back to the Lord. The cup in the family that my father has given me, will I not drink it? Why are we acting like Peter, cutting off people's ears, cutting off people's hands, ill-treating people because we are defending so-and-so, defending such and such? Why should his wife do like that? Why should the husband do like that? Keep quiet. And just give them into the hands of the Lord that whatever the Lord has in mind, for allowing this to take place in the life, in the family of this brother, of this sister. Let's be praying for them that the grace and the strength to carry the cross and to drink the cup that the Heavenly Father has given them, that the Lord will give them the grace and the strength. And so he tells us in Matthew chapter 26, reading from verse 50. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, where art thou come? You know he was talking to? He was talking to Judas Iscariot. And he said, friend, friend, how do you talk to your persecutors? How do you talk to those who betray you? How do you talk to those who hand, up, hand you over to Pilate and to Caiaphas and to the chief priests? How do you talk to the people that hand you over to the landlord and say, catch him. He has money, only he doesn't want to pay. How do you call them? Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and they took him. And behold, one of them which were, which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck his servant of the high priest, and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. Uh, look up here. You know, when I study the Bible, I'm very, very meticulous. I want to find out. How is it? Because when I read in John, John said, and Peter threw the sword, cut off the ear. John. When I read Matthew, Matthew said, one of the people drew the sword. He did not mention the name of Peter. And I begin to wonder, Matthew, tell me the name. No, I cannot tell you the name. Don't you know the name? Yes, I know. I cannot tell you. Okay, don't tell me. John will tell me. Why is it John is telling me the name and you, Matthew, you are not telling me the name. And Matthew says, we are apostles. And if you check up in all our lists, you'll find Peter, James, John, Andrew. Always the first four, the inner circle apostles. Me, you'll find my name somewhere near the bottom. John, in the inner circle with Peter, he can mention his name. They are colleagues. They want the mount of transformation of transformation together. And they were the people, the inner circle people. John can mention his name. Myself, 
What will come on me that I'll mention his name, not me? Honor to whom honor is due. Do we understand that here? Yes, we understand in the head. How do coordinators act to group coordinators? Are we not coordinators together? If uh, this group coordinator can talk about this group coordinator, why can't I talk about him too? You know, sometimes I, I'm, I'm, I'm watchful. We are here. And you call, a, you call a coordinator to come and teach. So the scripture. Sometimes for the first time that I'm trying that coordinator. And he will come here. And he will say, now, brother so and so, come and answer this question. And it is, that is his group coordinator. Then I wonder in my mind, of all the multitude here, look at this fellow. That were given chance to for the first time. And the first person he will call is his own group coordinator. So and so, or are you not there? I'm waiting for you. And if the, his own group coordinator, if he's uh, walking, he'll say, uh, because of our time, can you please run? He has a chance because now the pastor has elevated him today and has given him the microphone. So this is his chance and he can talk to anybody anyhow. But you know, when you study the scriptures, the scriptures, what the scripture does not say, you learn from it. What the scriptures say, you learn from that as well. Let's go on. We're looking at verse... Um, Verse 53 now. Thinkest thou not? Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father? And he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. But how shall the scriptures be fulfilled? That thus it must be. And that's what we're learning from the scriptures here. That there was submission to the will of God. And uh, the Lord also wants us to submit to his will. We're looking at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 1. Romans 12. Verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We'll come to point number three. Supplication and power to do God's will. If we're going to be able to do the will of God, we need strength. We need courage. We need power. We need skill. We need divine ability given unto us. That's why we need to pray. That's the need for supplication. Think about it. If the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, with all the miracles he performed, well, the fact that he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Well, the fact that the Holy Ghost came upon him. And he went in the power of the Spirit. And he came back in the might and the power of the Spirit. If the Lord Jesus Christ cast out devils by the Holy Ghost. If the Lord Jesus Christ had the power to raise dead Lazarus out of the grave. If they same Jesus needed to pray in agony and pray until he prayed through to be able to have the strength and the power to do the will of God. I about you and I. What do we know? What do we have? How can we do the will of God without real, real prayer? 
And that's why you'll find out that it's one thing to know the will of God. It's another thing to be able to do the will of God that you know. A, a, a woman knows that her husband is still far away. She has made restitution. She now wants to be joined to the husband that had pushed her away many years ago. But she is not praying. She will come to the church. Hear the message. Doing the will of God. After the message, she will take her bag, take whatever she has, and go back home. We know, as we are in our districts, there are some difficult knots to untie. Some burdens we are bearing. And some difficulties we are having. And we know, this is the will of God. He has put me in that district. I cannot jump out of the boat because of the storm. But I'm having difficulty inside that boat. And we come in here, we hear the word of God. And we will not pray and pray through until we are able to strike water inside the rock. How are we going to do the will of God? We know it's a difficult thing. We know the will of God is there, this cup I must drink. But I'm having difficulty. And, all, and, and my life is like complaining here, complaining there, complaining every time. But we will not pray. And as long as we will not pray, the strength and the power, the grace, the anointing to do that will of God will not be available. Supplication and power to do God's will. In Matthew chapter 26 again. Matthew chapter 26. Looking at verse 42. He went away again. The second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Verse 44. He left them and went away again. And he prayed the third time, saying the same words. When is the last time you really prayed? You are getting used to not praying. Difficulties are there. Just say, well, I'm praying. What kind of prayer? You pray and sweat. Do you pray and pour out your heart in agony? Do you pray and touch the heavens? Do you pray until strength comes from above? Do you pray until, even though the situation has not changed, but you have changed, that the prayer has changed you, and because the prayer has changed you, you are still in that same situation, but it's a difference entirely now. You are not like you used to be. That's the kind of prayer we're talking about. In Luke chapter 22, see what happened when Christ prayed. The prayer he prayed. Luke chapter 22, reading from verse 41. 22, 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. And kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father... If thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. The power, the strength that comes after he had prayed. And that's what the Lord is expecting that you will do. That when you call upon the Lord, you wait upon the Lord. He renews your strength. And then you are able to live the life you ought to live. And going about saying, it's not an easy road. All that you will get out of your mouth. 
Father along, well, understand why. I don't understand why I'm going through this. And all that will go away from your mouth. There will be joy, the joy of the Lord, which is so strange. And you'll be able to seek even in the furnace of fire. Because the Lord himself had sent his angel. And he had come to strengthen you for the battle of the day. And for the thing that you are going through. He tells us in Psalm 143. Psalm 143. Reading there from verse 10. Here is a prayer of this man of God. Teach me to do thy will. I know it is to do it. I want power. I want strength. I want ability. I want instruction. I need counseling. Teach me to do thy will. For thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2. Reading from verse 12. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which walketh in us. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God that walketh in us. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. If you will pray. And you will call upon the Lord. And you say, Lord, I'm having difficulty doing your will. Not just doing it grudgingly. Doing it and dragging my feet. Doing it and crying. Doing it and complaining. Doing it and struggling and fighting. Yes, I know I must do it. Because only those who do the will of God will get to the kingdom of God. But it's not easy. I wish uh, this uh, cup will pass by me. I wish that even this life will end. I wish that Jesus will come now. That's how you are doing the will of God. With joy. With delight. A delight should do thy will, O oh God. If that is going to take place, you'll pray. You'll seek the face of the Lord. And your prayer life will change. You abandon yourself into the hands of the Lord. And you say, Lord, do something in me. Until I now begin to enjoy your will, whatever that will may be, until I take that cup voluntarily and joyfully and cheerfully, and I drink that cup, and people will not even see on my facial appearance how bitter the cup is. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Has I not known? Has I not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the hair, of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint. You know why? Because their physical strength. Physical ardor, vigor, will fail them, and they don't pray. And be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, like Peter. But they that wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord. You have difficulty? They that wait upon the Lord. This work of the Lord in your hand is becoming a burden. They that wait upon the Lord. The stories you are telling, heartache, headache, almost having ulcer, because of the work in the district, they that wait upon the Lord. The way you are going about the work of God, and even the way you come to the central fellowship. If we don't go now, they will not allow us to teach on Sunday. 
grudgingly, complaining. All these people, they don't appreciate. They are biting their fingers, feeding them. The more I do good, the more they are doing evil to me. All the preaching I've done, all the activity in the district, all my money that I gave into the district that this will happen, this will happen. Nobody appreciates it. And you can't sleep at night. And you're having hypertension now. Because of thinking of the disappointments you have in the work. But if you're going to renew your strength, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The Lord can strengthen us. I said the Lord will strengthen us. If we come to wait upon the Lord, how long are you willing to pray? How fervently are you willing to pray? How much are you willing to abandon yourself in prayer unto the Lord, saying, I've got the key now. I've got the secret now. I must wait upon the Lord. Things are going to change. Things will change in your life. Things will change in your family. Things will change in the district. All the sorrow, all the crying, all the dragging of it, everything will pass away. Now you will mount up with wings as eagles in Jesus' name. Rise up and let us pray the way we ought to pray. Knowing the will of God. Doing the will of God. Submitting to the will of God. Accepting the will of God. Not caring what happens around you. Not caring what they do. Not caring what they say. Not caring how the cup is. How bitter the cup may be. The cup that my father has given me. Will I not drink it? Drink all of it. Drink all of it. Drink it cheerfully. And drink it joyfully. And drink it happily. No complaints. No murmuring. No dodging. Don't dodge it. Put your neck under the yoke. Hold the cup in your hand. Put it in your mouth and drink all of it. Do the work of the Lord joyfully and happily. Open up the fountain of your heart before the Lord. Have you been dodging that cup? Complaining, going about a murmuring? Are you trying to leave the word of God, the work of God, because of what you are going through? Come on to get sea money. Come on to get sea money. Pour your heart out before the Lord. The grief, the sorrow, the agony. Don't dodge it. Don't dodge it. Don't dodge it. Receive it from the hand of the Lord. Let the suffering, let the agony, let the burden, let the difficulty draw you closer, nearer unto the Lord. The will of the Lord be done. Salvation, that's the will of God. Sanctification, that's the will of God. Suffering for righteousness sake, that is the will of God. Offer yourself to the Lord. Don't let the cross drive you back from the narrow way. Don't let this cup drive you away from the center of the will of God. Don't let the difficulty, the difficulty in your family, the difficulty in your place of work, the difficulty in the job, the difficulty in the ministry, don't allow the difficulty to drive you away from the center of the will of God, from the appointment of the Lord for your life. Willingness, readiness to do the will of God. The will of the Lord be done. The will of the Lord be done. The will of the Lord be done. Comes with persecution, the will of the Lord be done. Comes with agony, the will of the Lord be done. Drives you to get sea money. The will of the Lord be done. I don't know why they are doing this against me. The will of the Lord be done. The cup of shame. And the cup of reproach in the family. Don't worry. The will of the Lord be done. 
You pray until spiritual strength will come into your life. Spiritual power will come into your life. All the discouragement, all the complaining, all the murmuring, everything will pass away. Strength will come. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run, they'll not be weary, they'll walk and they'll not faint. Are you sleeping like Peter? Like James? Like John? They slept when they ought to be praying. When the trial came. When the temptation came, when the test came, they failed. They failed. Because there was no prayer. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Lest he fall into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me. With my whole heart, I'll agree, and my answer will be, Lord, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me. With my whole heart, I'll agree, and my answer will be, Lord, once again, I'll say yes, Lord, yes. I'll see you.